All right, coming up next, the beginning is reading poetry. Welcome to the Booking. My name is Nathan Opperson, and I am your humble and obedient host. I am joined by Pastor Jacob Mensel. Jake, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing pretty well. But really, Jake, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing okay. Brandon! We're also joined by Brandon Chastine, the man, the myth, the legend. Hey. How are you doing, Brandon? Good. Is Jake no longer the pastor who's a master of reading? Oh, I forgot all about that. Jake is the pastor who's a master of reading. That's me. Congratulations, Jake. You may have thought that that was only a 2006 honor, but it turns out in 2017, you are again being awarded. 11 years later. Oh, sorry. It turns out in, it turns out in 2017. Yeah, that's right. What did I say? You said 2006. Oh, it turns out in 2017, you are being awarded, Pastor Who's a Master of Reading, yet again. Two years in a row. By the committee consisting of me. All right. folks we're so glad that you could join us this is actually the first episode that we are recording in 2017 the anna karenina episode we recorded on a cold winter's day at the end of 2016 the only cold winter's day yeah so far it's been a kind of a disappointing winter yeah, a little bit, unless it was you, cold that day, wasn't it? Was it was cold, yeah. Folks, we have a confession to make. We're not going to be talking about Emma today. We're going to still be talking about Emma. We're so glad that you're reading along with us and that you read Emma. We love you. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your listening to the booking, and we appreciate the fact that you read Emma just so you could hear our pithy thoughts, and those pithy thoughts are on their way. However, they are not going to be coming in the episode today because someone, I'm not going to say who, did not finish reading Emma on time. I'll give you a hint. It was someone in this room. One of the three participants in this very podcast. But I'm not going to say this is going to be like one of those Spartacus things where everybody says I am Spartacus and you have to guess who it was. Or not. Yeah, you don't have to. Maybe you just don't care. Yep. Um. (laughs) I am Spartacus. (laughs) I am also Spartacus. (laughs) Uh, yeah, we're all Spartacus. Um, I'm Spartacus. So folks, folks, we're falling on this sword together. None of us read Emma. That's not true. Only one of us didn't read Emma. But I'm not going to tell you who it is. Whoever that person is, though, I'm sure they feel bad. I'm sure they feel guilty. I'm sure sweat is pouring down their brow right now. If you could only see them. If you could see the tears that they're shedding. Could be me. Could be Brandon. Could be Jake. You just don't know. You just don't know. But you don't know yet. <laughs> uh, Brandon is, of course, referencing the president of these United States. He's building that wall, building that wall, signing those things. You got to love the guy in that room full of men. He's apparently going to declare war on both the media and Chicago. OK, yeah. Two worthy targets as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Actually, I like Chicago. It's got that bean. I like the bean. The bean. Yeah. You know the bean. You know the bean, Jake. Yep. You don't know the bean? I know the bean. You know the bean. Everybody knows the bean. All right, so folks, welcome to the booking. We are not going to do Emma today, which just means goodbye. Thank you for listening. See ya. What's that sound? It's the... It's an alarm. <laughs> it's the bells tolling. It's the bells tolling for thee and for me and for me and me. Um, no, it's the alarm. It's the it's the emergency poetry alarm. Oh, no. <laughs> What are we going to do? Uh, the EPA, not the Environmental Protection Agency. We are within strict environmental regulations here. Everything is above the board. But it is the EPA, the Emergency Poetry Alarm, which means we have to do a whole episode on poetry. 
That's our punishment or reward because someone didn't finish reading Emma in time. So we're going to do Emma. That'll come next week or next time that we you do a new series of these things. Oh, no, but poetry sucks. I hate poetry. I didn't like having to read it in high school. Whatever shall I do? Grow up. Get over it. Yeah, that's right. That was a character that I was playing. That wasn't really me. I wasn't giving my real opinion right there. I was being sarcastic for the purposes of rhetoric. I actually love poetry. If you agreed with me, that was a trick, and you lose. So, poetry. Brandon, tell twist us. Twist ending. <laughs> yeah, twist it's ending. It's over. <laughs> Eat your heart out, M. Night Shyamalan. Brandon, poetry. Tell us all about it. Bang, bang. Contextual Texan. Whoa. Poetry. <laughs> tell us about it. My goodness. Um... Folks, I have a lot of energy tonight. I'm excited about this poetry episode, actually. We threw it together last minute, and now Brandon's going to tell us all about poetry. Yes, I'm going to tell you all about poetry. <laughs> Everything there is. And you're going to help me. From the Epic of Gilgamesh to, uh, what's the thing that it would end with? The New Yorker. To the New Yorker. From Gilgamesh to the New York. Brandon, I want you to start with the <laughs> Epic of Gilgamesh and take us well, all the way from the New to the death of poetry. A.K.A. <laughs> the New York. <laughs> so I need you to there do this in freestyle. There were wanted to say things in a poetical way. <laughs> What is poetry? What is poetry, Brandon? Well, yeah, it's, that question. we can start by saying it is an art. And it is an art. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Man, what is poetry? That's a hard That's a hard question. People have tried to answer that. We can say what poetry is not. What is poetry not? Because I think from the earliest times with Plato, you had your philosophers wanting to say that poetry certainly was not philosophy. Okay. And poetry certainly was not rational. And so therefore, let's throw all those poets out of the city. <laughs> from <laughs> the you... earliest times, a.k.a. Yeah. the days of Plato. From the days <laughs> Of Plato, the earliest times as we call them, right? <laughs> as they are want to be called. As they are want to be called. I've been put on the spot, people. <laughs> I don't, yeah. Folks, we're doing this episode without a lot of preparation. Please okay, okay. give us but Well, I mean, poetry, if you wanted to just ask Alexa, if you just want to get a definition out on the table, what is poetry? It's a way of expressing yourself artfully with words in metrical form. Often that uses rhyme, but it doesn't have to use rhyme. But one of the essentials of poetry is that it has a musicality to it. What do we mean by musicality? Or what do I mean by musicality? Rhythm created through the sound of the words. It's rhythm created consonants through... Consonants and assonance, which that means the way that the hard sounds of a word and the vowel sounds of the word play off of one another. But Brandon, what about modern New Yorker poetry? or what I've seen poetry that just does, it seems like a bunch of words and they're kind of, you know, not a lot of meter or rhythm or anything. And that feels kind of like anything can be poetry. Yeah, my thoughts on that is that when you have avant-garde poetry like that, it only can exist because the actual good stuff exists. And so that's, that's created and exists in dialogue with the stuff that's actually the craft of poetry. So just like when you got, oh, who's that guy, Schoenberg in music, who did the atonal system and was deconstructing music, he could only do that because Bach and Beethoven had existed and they had written music. And so the reason that you get your modern poetry is because you have guys like Yeats and whoever you want, so you want to throw on the table, Shakespeare. Great, Milton, Shakespeare, who have actually written and participated in the hard craft of writing poetry. So... Why is poetry a hard craft? Because it's hard to not s just make something that sounds like roses are red, violets are blue. It's hard to not just sound like you're um, skipping along with your words, and it's hard not to just sound like your rhymes are obvious. And it's even harder to do the other thing that poetry does, which is use words to express the world of feeling and experience in a way that is unexpected and helps us see the world in a new way. It does that largely through metaphor and through imagery and through symbolism. So think of an obvious example that everybody would probably know. An obvious poem that everyone would know. Stopping by woods in a snowy evening. Yeah, so that takes the metaphor of the woods, the imagery of the woods, the loneliness of it, the silence of the snow, these things that are common experience to everyone. And through the repetition of the lines through the musicality of the verse. It kind of lulls you into the quietness of the woods with him, but then also you realize that by lulling you into this quiet of the woods with him, he's also making you feel his loneliness and his weariness. And so poetry works that way to make you feel something, and so in a way that you've never felt it before or in a way that you've never realized you felt it before. And then I liked what Harold Bloom said, even though I've had reservations about Harold Bloom in the past, but there's a certain inevitability to poetry in the sense that when, well, I think there's an inev inevitability to a lot of art, 
So when you see the Sistine Chapel, you say, yeah, that's something that's, it's there. It exists and it's beautiful. And with poetry too, when the poet finds a way to say something, it, there's an inevitability to it as though it should have been said that way. It feels like it's always been said yeah. and it will never right. stop being said. I think of something like the song Yesterday by the Beatles. It just feels like, as far as pop songs go, that Paul McCartney just had to kind of discover it. It's the statue that sculptors talk about. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David, and there David was. He was waiting for me. All I had to do was get rid of the excess stone. It's that artistic inevitability that truly great work has. Yeah, so there's that quality to a really great work of art, and poetry has that in common with all art. But there is the way that poetry helps us, in which I think is really what poetry at essence is, understand the world. And so Robert Penn Warren, he has this book called Understanding Poetry, which if you want to have a good primer course in poetry, I would highly recommend you go out and buy. You can still find them online, but they're expensive. They were the textbook that they used at Yale back in the 60s. Um, Robert Penn Warren, he's a famous author. He wrote All the King's Men. But he also wrote some really good poems, too. He was a Rhodes Scholar, really smart guy. He says that poetry is a way of saying that's very different than any other form of saying. And what he means by that is that we all have lived experience in common. So we all, we've all existed in the world. We all have these feelings and emotions about things, even about objects and about actions and about just the simple simple day-to-day -day things like laundry. R Richard Wilbur has a really good poem just about laundry. But the poet takes it and they make it, they take what is unique about that situation or about something that you would never maybe actively think about it and then put it into this musical verse where it seems to take on a meaning. Now, whether or not the meaning is really there, if it's just because the verse is beautiful, sometimes that happens. Sometimes the meaning really is there and it's a part of the way that they're playing with the images and with the words and with the metaphors. But I think that's what the, separates the really great poets from just, I don't know, the hacks. The, the schlock. It's a little bit like what we were talking about last episode with Tolstoy. He gives you a birth scene. He gives you a love scene. He gives you a proposal scene. And I was thinking about that, too. I think that one of the great things about any artistic medium is that it's limiting. And if it's a painting, you can't hear it. You're not watching movement. You're not smelling it or tasting it. And so it calls your attention to one thing in particular and a good poem you know it, it in a good painting you maybe you do actually smell it maybe you do see movement maybe you do hear it but it's something that you hear or taste or smell in your imagination and i think the same thing's true of and uniquely true of uh of, of poetry in that way because it it's limiting it's limiting it's it's words on paper so it's just your imagination um, and then it's words on paper constrained to rhyme in verse to meter everything about it that's limiting is what o creates the possibility of opening up you know a new world a new insight a new way of seeing things it causes you to stop and focus in on that one turn of phrase or that one moment and that's why to do it artfully is so challenging it is it, and when it's done well it seems impossible because well, it seems so simple and yeah well, that's the thing if you're not paying attention it might seem easy and obvious and actually you might not ever think about how impossible it is because it just seems like oh there it is it was always there it was always there it gives you that sense of it was always there and yeah that's obvious and uh, and and yet the ability to to craft that sort of thing is this is so hard yeah and so poetry, especially for men, has a bad rap because most of what's the stereotype of poetry, that it's effeminate, it's all about love and feelings. It's pretentious. It's pretentious, which that's a fault of things like The New Yorker and that whole cult. The New Yorker is just borrowing from that culture, but it's really a fault of guys like T.S. Eliot who... Even though he had something he was trying to do. Well, T.S. Eliot's an example of someone who at his worst is just loads everything up with so many allusions and references that you almost have to read with like, you know, a dictionary or a, a Wikipedia next to you. So you can just like be looking up thing after thing after thing. It rewards you for being more well learned and well read than most of us have time yeah. to be. It's like certain educational movements, their intentions are good, but the kind of fruit and people it attracts ends up not being all that great. And so T.S. Eliot is kind of like that. His intentions were actually 
fine. Mm-hmm. One day, I guess, we'll probably talk about T.S. Eliot, but the fruit he produced was pretty bad. It was just pretentiousness in academia. Poetry is is a way of seeing the world, and it does have a lot to do with feeling. Um, it's inevitable. Poetry is a way to understand actions and understand objects through the way that we see them and smell them and feel them and think about the past and nostalgia and all these things they are in poetry. Well, they're really the two aspects, right? Art wants you to see the world the way it is, and it wants you to feel a certain way about it. Yeah. And so it's teaching you how to think about something and also how to feel about it at the same time, one way or another. Even if it's pretending to not or intending to not, it's it's still doing it. Yeah, and so that's where the debate with, to go back to Plato, why he wanted to throw the poems out of the city is because it would just incite feeling and emotion without reason. And that it would make reason at the service of feeling. And so a lot of people want to th- who don't like poetry, they might think that it's useless. They'd rather just have their science and their engineering and their philosophy. But I would say that if you have any enjoyment in philosophy, it's probably because there's something poetic about the philosophy you're reading. And if you get any enjoyment out of some small minutia of science, it's like real enjoyment of the beauty of it. That's because suddenly science has stepped into poetry for you. And so poetry is not just limited to a poem on the page, but there's a poetic experience, and that's what the poet is trying to get at. Yeah, it strikes me while you're talking that when you hear the most godless, atheistic people talk about science, you know, the most Dawkins or Hitchens before he died, those kinds of people, they attain a sort of uh, poetic... um, standing on the cusp of a black hole seeing the past seeing the future yeah. you know they find they find the divine and the poetic within their what they think is their cold you know quote unquote rationality yep transcendence is the mm. word that you're that yeah. is the word that i'm looking for yeah so poetry it taps into that and that's why it's also can be dangerous because you can then end up getting like keats where he was all about what was it negative capability he was a mystic just, yeah was... where you're just all about feeling and so yates went the same way he became absolutely crazy and you had walt whitman who was talking about poets being the new priests of the world and so there's an idolization that goes along with poetry, too, which is where you get the whole idea of poets being stuffy, pretentious. I would argue that that whole movement starts, though, with that idea of transcendence. Art is transcendent, and you have a, you know, you have a poetic moment and a moment of true transcendence. I remember my first one, like the, my first sort of out-of-body transcendent moment was I couldn't have been more than somewhere between five and seven. Went to the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And it was this out of body transcendent experience. And if you uh, fixate on on that and don't see the, the God that it all points to, then it's easy to make an idol out of it and to and then to create your your cult around it. And your priests, your priests are just arbit- arbiters of tra- of the transcendence. So if poetry is how you experience transcendence, then yeah, your poets are your priests. But that's just one very teeny tiny bit of the puzzle. Yeah, which and you see that in the history of poetry. A lot of the early poems are much more craft driven, and they're just about playing with language and with image. So Shakespeare's a lot like this. His sonnets are very intricate, but you don't get the sense of this transcendent moment that he's driving towards as you would in, say, a Yeats poem or a T.S. Eliot poem. Can you give us, in like just a couple of minutes, a crash course in the history of poetry for people who just don't know anything? Yeah, how about a crash course in the history of English poetry? Yeah, that sounds good. (coughs) Well, (laughs) once upon a time, England was a bunch of Celts running around trying to kill one another with blue paint, and then the Romans invaded. (laughs) They brought Latin. Get rid of that blue paint. Oh, yeah. And then the Romans got defeated when you had the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes. All those guys come over. What you have is you have a very Germanic heavy language. And Germanic language is by nature very alliterative. And it works best with alliterative sounds. So we talked a little bit about this with Beowulf. And so the earliest English poetry you have is more driven by consonants and assonance than it is by meter and rhyme. And so... With the early poetry like Beowulf, or is it, well, for example, is it I um, so the spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings that led them had courage and greatness, right? So you have the spear Danes in days gone by, the da and the da, and had courage and greatness. All those things, the, the poetry is driven by, there's a break, which is called the Caesura, and then you have two l- lines to it, and the, 
the poetry is formed by the echoes that happen on either side of the lines with the sounds that they're being made. As England developed and as it got invaded again by this time the Normans with William the Conqueror, he brought French and he brought European influence. And what that did is it married the Germanic roots of the English language to the more romance-driven sounds of French poetry, which French poetry, because it is very vowel-heavy, doesn't really lend itself as well to the alliterative style. Instead, it's more metrical and more... um, Da, 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 da. It gets more of its rhythm. It's rhythm-based with its movement, and it also has more rhyme with it. So um, this all began to develop, and then you get into the 1200s. I think her name was Eleanor of Aquitaine. She is one who's actually very influential with some of the Arthurian legends coming over from France, because King Arthur, and a lot of that is actually French in origin. Sorry to rain on anybody's parade out there, but... Um, <laughs> No! <laughs> He's supposed to be Mel Gibson. <laughs> Sean Connery, I thought. Sean Connery, that's right. Yeah, and then Richard Gere is Lancelot. <laughs> that's right. As we all know. And the greatest <laughs> of the Ethereum yes. <laughs> legends. <laughs> the last night. Yes. Was it the call? No, the first night. First night. First yeah, night. First, first night. night. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, he played, the last he played Richard the Lionhearted in the Robin Hood movie. With right. Great. So this, but this all develops, and then you begin to get in the around the 1300s some of the courtly poetry that we would come to know, and so the French forms and some of the Italian forms as you get in the Renaissance with Petrarch. But Petrarch is an Italian that we yeah are, he's an Italian. We're taking the form and bringing. But it he's into the English. one who kind of he was, he established some of these forms of poetry, and so that's where you get the sonnet as a Petrarchan form. And so it comes over to England through these courtly influences, and you have these courts where the um, young men are writing poems to their lovers, or you have uh, some of the lords are writing small folios just to give around the court. And earlier than that, you actually had bards. So you would have the traveling bard. That's the person who would have sang the Beowulf poem, for example, or the lays of like Laomon, Wace, and those are Arthurian. And soon you have, because of these courtly influences like the sonnet becoming popularized. What we see with the English language as it grows is that it's very it's a very flexible language and it can do things that like just German on its own or French on its own can't really do. But since it's the marriage of these things, it can be both it can it can both rely on the sounds within the line, but also the sounds at the end of the line with rhyme and also then metrical and have and so it's the perfect vehicle for the birth of some of the greatest poetry to have ever been written. And so you have Shakespeare who comes about and just after that there's not really a whole lot to say about poetry except that I mean it stays pretty much courtly for a while and then you get into the 1700s, which you have some fun stuff with like Alexander Pope, and it becomes very classical. Uh, before him, you had Milton. They were borrowing a lot from the Romans, and so you have the pastorals and you have epics with Paradise Lost. But poetry becomes a vehicle for expressing story, for telling large stories and long stories. So Edmund Spencer with the Fairy Queen and Milton with Paradise Lost are probably the two most famous examples. The point is, is that you have courtly poetry, but then it's also beginning to become more varied with more forms that are coming in. And then it's becoming, then as society, as as things begin to change, you get um, your industrial revolution, things become boring, you get people responding and they want to respond by becoming bohemian free thinkers. And so that's when in the late 1700s, early 1800s, you get your romantic poets. And that's when your first real revolution in poetry happens is with the romantic poets. And that would be Shelley and Byron. Yeah, and Shelley, Byron, Keats. And these guys are all about introducing the idea of transcendence and um, the poetic muse back into poetry. And so it becomes a lot more florid. It becomes a lot more um, emotive than, for example, Alexander Pope would have been, who they were responding against, or um, that even Shakespeare would have been. Because those guys were more driven by the craft of just crafting good poetry. And these guys, they wanted to craft good poetry, but there was this sense of um, ego and sense of the poet as God 
coming into play. And so after that, is that enough? Or do we yeah. want to keep going? Yeah, yeah. I mean, keep going. Yeah, after that, you get into the Victorian age, and then things kind of go back for a while. So, you know, history tends to cycle. Well, the next big shift would happen with World War One. So with the Victorian age, things kind of, beca- not quite become stodgy, but they become more classical. Oxford takes over. Um, you get the Americans with some of its wildness, and so you get the poets over there. Is it Longfellow? And, but the most famous one being Walt Whitman. He's just kind of a romantic poet in his own bent. He's What he added to the mix was something something that never needed to be added to the mix because Shakespeare was already doing it better. But he added blank verse or free verse. Shakespeare did blank verse. And everybody thought he was a genius for it, but that's he was just Shakespeare being lazy. <laughs> My opinion. <laughs> um, and then finally you get to the the next big shift in poetry comes after World War One when all the young men are sent out. Is it Wilfred Owen who's the famous World War One poet who... One of them died. Oh, you have like Sassoon, him. all those guys. They're writing poetry on the front line. And then you have guys like T.S. Eliot who are actually fighting. And, and when he comes back, he's just disenchanted right. with the whole... We've talked about this group yeah. of people yeah. many and times. So his most famous ex- poem is The Wasteland. And that becomes a catalyst for what becomes modernism, where you're just disenchanted with all the tradition you've inherited. And so The Wasteland is famous for being highly illusioned. Based. So he's showing that all of history is just fragmented and broken apart, and he's just throwing lines together to make this poem. Point being that that's when you begin to see people try to start struggling with trying to find different ways of expressing themselves with poetry. And so you get the weird forms of like um, William Carlos Williams, the e. Red e. Cummings. Barrel. What's the what's the famous William Carlos? Yeah, the Williams? Red Will. So much depends upon the Red Will Barrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. End of poem. Yep. And their th- idea was that they just wanted to look at the world and see the world as it was and try to just kind of clean themselves of emotion, all the stuff, all the baggage of the Victorian age, of all these other um, periods, and just treat the object as the object and look at the world straight on and be hard so that you can see where Hemingway would have come out of this tradition. And then um, after that, the world just gets crazier. You eventually get things like the beatnik poets. And um, so they would have been guys like Allen Ginsberg and um, Jack Kerouac in America. And then you also get postmodernism where you get some really just bizarre and crazy things where people are wanting to try to think of an example where you just get random words on pages and random images. And so you get Dadaism and um, surrealism and all these other movements that are trying to deal with both expressing yourself in a new way, but also dealing with the fact that they don't think that there's truth in the world and that the world is broken and that um, capitalism in particular is broken and that hopefully art can find a way to make it better. And that's kind of where we still are today. Mm -hmm. Um, you do still get, though, poets. I mean, it's not like all of the old traditions are dead. You still get little movements here and there that pop up. I would the neo, not neoconservative movement, but the new criticism, which Robert Penn Warren would have been a part of. They were all about getting back to the roots. And so Robert Lowell, Elizabeth Bishop, Robert Penn Warren, those guys, and they're really good and worth reading. That's kind of a scattershot overview of English history of okay. poetry. I think the obvious question that follows is why should anybody care? Like, we have people listening to this probably that enjoy reading novels because there's a story, they can get into it, whatever. It's like a movie, except for it's on with words. So maybe it's a little bit more boring than a movie, but you know, but you're going to read a poem. I mean, I don't, in other words, I don't think we've quite answered the question of poetry's for loser or effeminate. I once had someone. I forget where I was, but someone yelled out that they were asking what are like effeminate things and someone yelled out poetry. That's just so stupid. It really is a dumb way of thinking because I mean, the obvious example for a Christian and the obvious answer for a Christian is King David. And if he was effeminate, uh... (laughs) (laughs) who shall we find that's masculine enough for you? (laughs) And he wrote poetry. One of the most prolific poets of... Antiquity. Yeah, there's no way you can get around it. The Psalms are poetry. Mm-hmm. Well, um, all the minor prophets are actually poetry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, if if your definition of effeminate includes warriors and prophets, then yeah, and Job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, this is not what you were asking, but I think knowing the history of poetry helps mm-hmm. because it helps you understand that what they're reacting largely to is everything that happened with Keats on mm-hmm. 18th century. And there's really good things that happened even, like Matthew Arnold is really good, Mm -hmm. and Alexander Pope is really good. They were men, 
Right. And they were British, so they were stodgy. And, you know, every British man is a little bit effeminate. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We said it, folks. <laughs> That's the Bookening's official opinion. Every British man is a little bit effeminate. <clears throat> Not a lot, but a little. <laughs> I think, maybe I'm imprinting my own experience on the world here, but I think when most people think of poetry, th- certainly when I thought of it before I knew anything about it, I just kind of assumed it was what's really the romantic strain. I assumed it was gay guys on hills writing about daffodils and streams and uh walt whitman not walt whitman yeah well walt whitman talking to a blade of grass right <laughs> or um oh who am i think william wordsworth wordsworth where he's just um, sitting on the london bridge talking to the beautiful water flowing under i either assumed that it was that or i assumed it was sex because you know that's what you hear is love sonnets, love poems, or nature. Um, seeking transcendence in nature. So that's kind of what I assumed it was. And I was wrong. I mean, there is a lot of stuff like that out there. Sex and nature are two fairly profound things that happen in the human condition, as it turns out, in my opinion. But I don't know. What do you want to say, Jake? What do you want to say to people that um, poetry is for lame academics and stuff? The one person that poetry is not for is lame ap- academics. All they know how to do is rob it, deconstruct it. Mm-hmm. I don't know that there's a lot to say to somebody like that except... Read some. Not just read some even because it's oh, oh, really stupid. You know, I, it's, sort of like, um, it's sort of like trying to describe music to somebody who's tone deaf. And what you want to do is say, no, you need to sit down and listen. And, and don't bother with the effeminate stuff because there is a lot of pretentious effeminate stuff out there but read until you find something that connects with you and if you can't find anything that connects with you find some things that connect with people you trust and memorize or meditate on it or just not and you know live a dull barren colorless colorless existence existence. (laughs) that was what i was trying not to say but he finished the thought for me (laughs) that was how i thought the thought should be finished um that's where i was headed but listen if you don't know how to read the psalms then i think we can at least say that you're that's a problem yeah look you should take in large measure your your understanding of of good poetry from the psalms from scripture what the psalms do for us is they they teach us how to to think about god how to feel about God and how to feel about the world that he's made, how to feel about the things that we deal with. The Psalms encompass the full range of human experience and human emotion in relation to God. And so they are a response to everything going on outside or inside of us, but in relation to God. And they model, um, it's not just a uh, prayer. It is it is prayer, and it's more than that. It's a um, thoughtful, there's no way to back myself out of that corner, of saying it's not just prayer. His <laughs> prayer is like, you know, um, it is prayer. It's a heightened, the, it, what it is, is, is. It's, it's heightened. It's a heightened form of prayer. Song and poetry are a heightened form of prayer. I, um, I only ever wrote poetry for class assignments until I became a Christian. And for some inexplicable reason that I, <laughs> one of the first things I did when I became a Christian is buy a composition book. And I wrote, I started writing prayers, but they were poems, but they were prayers. Mm-hmm. And it was almost a daily experience. There are notebooks somewhere. I wish I knew where they were of just prayers and prayers and prayers that are poetry. And I think that that's, um, you know, I know that's not natural for everybody. Um, yeah, so I don't want to set up a false standard of what your life should be like and what your prayer life should be like. Uh, I haven't lived that way for a long time, but I do think it's a natural, heightened form of devotion mm-hmm. to God. And the Psalms teach you and train your your mind, your heart, how to think and feel about the world God made and who God is. Um, and I think you just have to take a step back and realize that God, through His Holy Spirit, inspiring a man to write could have had him write, the Lord cares for people deeply. But instead, he had him write, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, he could have wrote, had him write, God is very powerful. But instead, he had him write, he shrouds himself in darkness and flies down upon the wings of yeah. cherubs. God uses language <laughs> to make things beautiful and to make them stick in our memory and to make them powerful. Uh, as George Orwell famously pointed out, it could have been, if we consider natural phenomenon, we will find that the reward doesn't always go to the proper individual that you would expect. But instead, it's the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the strong, and so on. And those things catch in your brain, and you remember them because they're beautiful poetry. And they affect you, and they move you, and they train your emotions because they're poetry, and not just because the thought is right, but because the way the thought is expressed 
is just as important. And so that's something that you see the Holy Spirit inspiring in men. And I don't want to get all mystical about it. I think you can become a Gnostic about words and words and the word and Jesus was the word and you can get weird. And I've known some people that are weird about it. And I'm not saying get weird about it. I'm not saying get extra scriptural about it, but just get biblical about it. Just get biblical about it. The fact is God didn't give us a science book. Mm -hmm. There's many sections that are perfectly blunt, obvious, and unpoetic. But there's poetry and history and all kinds of, and you got to take and understand that God knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what we need. And apparently what we need is at the very least 150 chapters of poetry and a bunch of prophets, minor and a prophets bunch of that prophets. read like beat poets, and a bunch of wisdom literature that's full of metaphor and illusion. And is poetry? Yeah, that's good. Poetry teaches you how to feel mm-hmm. with your experiences of the world, and and it's a powerful tool that you know, in the hands of King David, in the hands of the Holy Spirit, is powerful, and in the hands of a wicked man is guess what? Just as powerful. Oh, yeah. right. That's why a lot Not of people just as powerful, but it's no. powerful. But that's, it's why, that's why people want to throw the baby out with the bath is because, yeah, I mean, Plato's right. Poetry's dangerous. Yates can lead you astray. Brandon, you talked about that in an episode, how much yeah. you were into Yates because you wanted to feel that transcendent Irish kind of like the fairies leading you the into the woods. longing and the, the nostalgia. Yeah, and the which is okay. Since that there's something more. Yeah. Yeah, but you can be manipulated by all kinds of things. You can be manipulated by <laughs> any form of... Tyson. Yeah, by Neil deGrasse Tyson, by any form of rhetoric, mm-hmm. yeah. right? You can be manipulated by a preacher. He can take you to heights and lows sure. about false things. The wrong use of a tool does not invalidate the right use of a tool. But it's worth saying it's a powerful tool and it can be dangerous, just like music can be dangerous. Just like, hey, maybe don't listen to a terrible pop song about sex because maybe you'll want to have sex a little bit more in a bad way. You know, uh, if you have a little common sense and a little wisdom, you can avoid some bad stuff. And it's worth avoiding the bad stuff and not yeah. just not either on the one hand saying poetry is dumb or on the other hand saying I'm going to open myself up to the experience of poetry and let it flow through me without a rational thought in my brain because I just discovered poetry. Or because it makes you hip and cool at the coffee house. (laughs) Or because it makes you hip and cool at the coffee house. (laughs) At the end of the day, we have a standard. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And a standard by which we can judge. Fortunately, there's all kinds of great poetry out there. And uh, we're going to recommend some good poetry to you in this episode. Right, guys? Yeah. Let's hope so. <laughs> Let's hope so, yeah. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go down our top five. Top five. We, we are going to count down our top five favorite poems. We're not saying that these are the best poems. They're just five poems that speak to us, baby. And we are going to just go through them. No particular order, I don't think, I guess. I don't have a top one. Yeah, we don't have a top one. Um, <laughs> I hesitate to say that mine are actually my top five, but... Yours actually are your top five. So you're going to hear Jake's top five. He thinks no other poems in the English language should ever be read. Should ever be read or listened to. He hates all other poems. Normally when people say I hesitate to make this my top five, they definitely mean these are my definite top five. You make a good point. (laughs) I've misconstrued your words yet again. (laughs) At least I didn't make you say it in this voice. (laughs) Jake's all like, these are my top five poems. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, so, so Spear Danes and Days Gone By Had courage and greatness <laughs> They had the courage kings that led them. So folks, we're going to read some poetry And if you don't like it, then uh, Turn it off and wait for Emma Turn it off and wait for Emma She's Just a beautiful sit there girl. and wait <laughs> Just sit there and wait <laughs> But you, you won't understand Jane Austen if you don't uh, and Not as well as you could if you don't understand poetry You won't understand anything if you don't like poetry Right, you certainly won't understand You're going to be a boring scientist mm-hmm. Boring scientist <laughs> Go fill out some spreadsheets <laughs> Go read your systematic theology <laughs> <laughs> Jake's not going to get on board with that one <laughs> Because it's not true. Um, As it happens, I teach systematic theology. But poetry helps. You can... Oh, no. (laughs) Systematic theology can also be poetry. Well, if you've ever read uh, your Calvin, you know that it's full of allusions and metaphor. And Calvin's actually really fun to read because of 
the poetic strain within Calvin. I would, dare I admit. I, it's not just the cold reason that, and even... It's not so, cold reason at all. Calvin's just fun to read. I mean, he's I, the I, best. We don't have time to get into yeah, it. Yeah, this is opening a whole can of worms. <laughs> but you get like these, it's the, is it this, I don't know if we want to pick a fight with these guys or not, but who cares? Yeah. Like the Circe Institute that is like a little branch of this new classical movement that's mm-hmm. going on. I think we follow them on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> Let's do this. Oh, yeah. um, Take them down. You know, <laughs> they've never liked anything all, or no, followed back. I don't think. You're just, I have a feeling that most. Well, I know that a lot of these people they read Homer just so they can have the cold idea that they've read Homer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's enough said. I mean, it's just real. Any real enjoyment of poetry is is dead because all it is is this reform tendency to just be very cold towards everything. Literature cannot. And it's be all about an intellectual academic, pride. Yeah. And poetry can become intellectual pride. And so I guarantee you most of them really, really love Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) If you could see my face, enough is said. Right. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I guess the point is you can't approach poetry or anything with that sort of coldness. And if if you do, it speaks a lot about you. Hey, guys, literature, if you're listening to this, it's not an academic checklist. You should really just... This is going to sound so gay, but... Read things that you enjoy. Find poets that you enjoy. And, you know, there's, there's just life is really short for you to just, yeah, there's some stuff you need to read so you can kind of be familiar with, so you can broaden your worldview or whatever. But ultimately, what we're going to be talking about today is five poems or poets that each of us really enjoys and likes and feel like they, uh, I ran out of yeah. for that one. And we'll show that we've are on both sides by next podcast doing our five favorite philosophy and systematic theologies right yep <laughs> we just better hope trying to start a flame war with <laughs> systematic theology we better hope that the person that didn't read emma does read emma so that we don't have to do our top five <laughs> philosophy next week all right guys let's get into our top five who wants to go first i think jake wants to go first you want to go first? Sure. Now, Jake, you've divided yours up into <clears throat> some categories, as I understand it. Yeah, well, um, I couldn't pick five, and I didn't know how to get myself out of certain rabbit holes. So what I did was, well, I think what I would have rather have done uh, is pick five poets or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, because the way that I, I consume poetry is not, um, you know, this one great poem that speaks to me is the one that I come back to or... Or is is a, is a thing that I really latch on to. I I more or less latch on to poets, and I like to I like to dig into their work. So I, I really love George Herbert. But we'll get to that because I'm going to start with one of my favorite poets, whose name is Traditional. That guy wrote a lot of good stuff. <laughs> he wrote a lot of good stuff. Or a lady? <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. Um, Probably not. Probably not. The thing about <laughs> no. The thing about a lot of things that make it into the canon of our, I, I don't know how to say it, our collective uh, cultural memory that have anonymous authors that go so far back, nobody really knows where it came from. It really ends up uh, feeling timeless. Um, is that I find that if I, that on paper, those, um, those poems, they don't, they don't have a lot of bang until you, I don't even know how to say it. It's like, um, are you talking about the difference between recitation and reading? Or are you talking about something until more... you join them with music? Well, maybe till you join them with music, or maybe till you hear them in, in, in some kind of context. It's like, uh, uh, yeah. I remember reading a letter by Yeats where he argued that all poetry is music. And every poem has some... Well, he was arguing that what he was writing had some sort of weird mystical music to it, if you just could hear it. Because <laughs> he was crazy. <laughs> but I do think he has a point. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is there's a simplicity to a lot of the, the things that make it into our traditional songbook. There's a simplicity that's sort of, you wonder, like, you know, how did this get into our traditional songbook? And yet, it because of how it connects to our co- shared cultural history, it really connects one way or another with us. And it's, it's, it's difficult to put that into words as, or to really understand why. But I think there's this whole world of traditional uh, songs and poetry that carries a lot of cultural baggage and makes makes those songs or poems really really meaningful old lang syne is a great example of that sort of thing but that's not the poem that i picked i picked from the poet traditional i picked a, a, a song called the parting glass i don't know how you want to go about this i think you so, sing it yeah right let's hear it 
Of all the money that e'er I spent, I spent it in good company. And all the harm that ever I did, alas, it was to none but me. And all I've done for want of wit to memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. If I had money enough to spend and leisure to sit a while, there's a fair maid in the town that sorely has my heart beguiled. Her rosy cheeks and ruby lips, I own she has my heart enthralled. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. Oh, all the comrades that e'er I had, they're sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts that e'er I had, they'd wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls into my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be with you all. I think it's originally Scottish, but the Irish have owned it. And it goes back, I think, the earliest record of it is somewhere prior to 1600. And it's a bar song, and it's a last call song. And if you listen to it, it's it, there's a way to, 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 to sing it that's sort of you know joyful and robust, and there's a way to sing it that's really sad. And it, to me, highlights something that we've talked about, going back to Sam Hamilton on this podcast and East of Eden, the, the deep uh, sadness that is underneath the, dr- the drunken joy of the Irish. Um, and you hear that in a lot of the Danny Boy or Old Lang Syne, again, that, that sort of uh, sadness and sorrow and the midst of friendship and camaraderie and the goodbye, um, mm-hmm. the farewell, that may be the last farewell. It's always... This death hangs over a lot of uh, poems and songs like this, and it hangs, I think, over this one. Yeah, it's that um, Irish sense of, it's not even nostalgia, because it's a sense that the fleetingness of time, I guess, mm-hmm. that everything changes and that you can't hold on to it, and they have a real grasp of it. Yeah, that's a sort of very Ecclesiastes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, they have a, had a troubled history. So. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm leaving the bar and yeah, it's like closing time. It's closing time. It's, I'm leaving the bar and I'm having my last drink and I'm the first to go. See you guys when I see you next. But um, well, it's just an, it's a universal experience, but it's the way that it's said and tied that's to the, the glass and tied to comrades. And mm-hmm. did, they mentioned lovers, right? Yeah. Yeah. All the, so it's just it's this feeling that I think we all have that when you're th- sitting sometimes and you just start remembering your past and all the friends you've had and you wonder what they've done with their lives and where they've gone and who they've become. Or it's that other feeling like when you're driving and then you look and you see a farmhouse and you wonder who lives there and what kids they've had and the fact that you'll never know. I mean, it's just this the bigness of... Mm-hmm. Well, and it, it's paired with a self-reflection. Well, I want to say it's paired with... it. Death is hanging over it on one side and and sin is hanging over it on the other side. And all the harm that ever I did, alas, it was to none but me. And there's this understanding of the the two most, there's love, there's friendship, there's death, there's sin. And it's all there. And it's all in the context of Phil, to me, the parting class. Mm-hmm, yeah. Good night. Enjoy be with you all. I think that's what we'll find probably a lot of the great poems and the great poets do is they take a very common experience and they find, I don't want to say what's transcendent, but they they find the spiritual and the, I don't, I don't know what the word is, but they find the reality behind it. So we all have that feeling of, as my hero Raymond Chandler said, um, to say goodbye is to die a little. Yep. And um, we all have that feeling, but we don't have time to the bar they do last call we don't sit there and say you know to say goodbye is to die a little but let me ponder this but it's like that 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 song freezes that moment and suddenly you get to see it from all the different angles and examine it and examine the feelings that go into it and realize that there is death and there is love and there is sin and there is all these things at play as you say goodbye and how unable you are to hold on to any of it Mm -hmm. it's all transient it's all dust so that's my well, I've got two that kind of fit in that. I'm trying to decide which one to read. So one is the Yeats poem, The Wild Swans at Cool, or Coule. Any clue how to say it? The trees are in their autumn beauty. The woodland paths are dry. Under the October twilight, the water mirrors a still sky. Upon the brimming water among the stones are nine and fifty swans. The nineteenth autumn has come upon me since I first made my count. I saw before I had well finished all suddenly mount and scatter wheeling in great broken rings upon their clamorous wings. I have looked upon those brilliant creatures, and now my heart is sore. All's changed since I, hearing a twilight, the first time on this shore, the bell beat of their wings above my head, trod with a lighter tread. Unwearied still, lover by lover, they paddle in the cold, companionable streams, or climb the air. Their hearts have not grown old. Passion or conquest, wonder where they will, attend upon them still. 
But now they drift on the still water, mysterious, beautiful. Among what rushes will they build? By what lake's edge or pool delight men's eyes when I awake some day to find they have flown away? Well, it's that same sense of the fleetingness. You can't hold on to this. I used to be so saddened and troubled by the fact that every morning and every evening there's a new sunrise and a new sunset, and then it goes away, and there's never another one like it. And then I, I guess science clicked in my brain, and I realized there's only a perpetual sunsetting and sunrising that's never stopping, and God's free to... Yeah. to throw it all away and it's always being lavished upon us and it's always being thrown away and it's beautiful and it's sad and so maybe all that to, all that actually says is the transience of life is a it's a delicate it's a beautiful and it's a sad thing a lot of the best poetry one way or another helps you yeah reflect on it because that's what this is. he's thinking on the fact that he's now seen these swans for 19 years and then he'll wake up and they'll be gone no somebody else will be seeing them and so it's tapping into this understanding that the transience is sad, inevitable, something that happens. And also the, this fact that your experience, even though he's a poet and he's putting it on paper, he, he's not the only human that's alive and he won't see the swans where they are when they go somewhere else. That there are experiences, there are sunsets, all these things that you'll never experience in your life. And that's just... It can either be the grounds of great sadness, which it is for some poets, or... Yeah. In a certain sense, I think it's hard to talk about some of this stuff because it's like, the poet just said it beautifully. What do we, you know... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that everybody's felt. Right. This is... I don't think this is unique to Yeats. He's not telling us something that... So here, here's understood. a question. What, what do you say to the guy who heard you read that poem and said... I don't get it. Like, I don't understand why that means anything to you. Yeah, life is transient. Why couldn't he have just said life is transient? Well, one answer is why couldn't God have just said the Lord cares for me instead of the Lord is my shepherd? Yeah, that's fine. That's all well and good, but I don't understand it. You don't understand what, why that's... What, what do you say to the person who says that? Like, okay, fine, teach me. I don't understand it. Like, why did the Lord say the Lord is my shepherd? Why did he talk about the swans? Why mm -hmm. why couldn't he have just made it simple and say life is transient? Why does it... Well, which means more to you? Which feels more to you? The fact that life is transient or the fact that you have now had this poem where you've been with a poet, he's telling you these things, you're seeing it through his eyes. You feel with him the night, the age coming on, and then the sadness as he realizes that the swans are going to leave. And it seems silly to say it, but in the poem, it makes the transience of life and this truth about your own life relevant to you. And um, in a way that just saying the fact to yourself doesn't do. It's in some way to branch into another form of uh, rhetoric. It's it's not that dissimilar from uh, from a parable yeah. from uh, Nathan coming to David to tell him the story about the man with the sheep and he could have just said you are an adult a, a you are an adulterer and a murderer but what he needed was not for david david knows he's an adulterer and a murderer david's been hiding you know he's been trying to avoid that he's been hardening himself to that what he needed was a way to cut to his heart yeah. and slip the rug out from underneath him in a lot of ways that's what good poetry does is it it pulls the rug out from underneath you one way or another it it says to your heart what life is transient says to your mind but can't when it can't get to your heart and so that one metaphor that one unexpected turn that one final how did it end they'll, they'll be gone or yeah. whatever one morning they'll be gone or however it ended you know suddenly it's a you're the man kind of moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think often the kind of person that, that feels that way about poetry is the kind of person that actually isn't self-reflective, that never stops and never thinks about his life himself. Yeah, so you're right. I hadn't thought of it that way. But with the Yeats poem, it's not necessarily that... So the swans, you're, it's not like every time you see a swan now, you're going to think of the transience of life. It's it, If it's working well, you're going to think of those things in your life that have that same transience. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a sunset or a sunrise, like you were thinking, or... And it's the, yeah, it's the power of the poem to tap into what is a uh, common experience to everyone. Well, and I think um, one thing that maybe we've been dancing around saying that we should just say is... You don't have to love poetry, but if your mind is never, if your soul is never illuminated by comparisons, you know, if metaphor doesn't work for you, I think that's a character flaw. I don't want to quite say sin, but, <laughs> uh, but I do want to say you're not functioning correctly because God has given us brains that are able to make comparisons between a thing and a thing. And 
illuminate truth that way. And Christ taught in parables because you compare one thing to another and you compare swans to the transients of life and you compare the way that God cares for us to the way that a shepherd cares for sheep. Suddenly you actually understand it. Little neurons fire in your brain and you understand a way in which God cares for us. You, 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 you understand more about it. And that's what poetry does. That's what metaphor does. And if you're insensible to that, I think that's a problem because I think God may have grace on you anyway, <laughs> but, but I, I, I think that's something that's not firing right in your soul or in your brain. I, I want to just say that because God uses comparisons. He uses metaphors all over his scripture. So you need to be able to, at the very least, grasp those. And if you have a good grasp of those, you ought to be able to enjoy it and profit by it where good humans do it. <laughs> Am I wrong? You're not wrong. No, you're not wrong. What this poem is doing is teaching you. It's teaching you to sit and to think about the swans and to think about one day they'll be gone. And you may never have lived near a lake or a pond or seen a swan in your life, but there are things in your life that should cause you to think that way or that you should reflect on in such a way that you think, you know, one day they'll be gone. One day. And so you need to be instructed. Your heart needs to be instructed, taught trained to, to be yeah. really lame about it to stop, stop and, and smell, smell the, the roses. roses i've been wanting to say that now for the i'm glad you finally <laughs> yeah one thing that people when you get in this debate about philosophy versus um poetry one argument is that poetry can teach wisdom as versus just teaching knowledge in the sense that poetry actually teaches you about what it is to be alive and a lot of wisdom has to do with just having lived and knowing what it is to be alive and sympathetic to other life but here, yeah and here's an idea i don't get to look at swans and contemplate everything that a swan might mean but a great man once sat and looked at swans and contemplated what swans might mean so i can actually take what he learned and apply it to my life and i don't ever have to bother with the swans um yeah. you know i mean that's great that's a great part of joining the conversation yeah is, you don't have to bother with swans but you do have to bother with Oh. Now, now that he said it, you have to bother with your version of that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I've got a poem about the trans, a different kind of a poem about the transience of life. Read it. Um, which I was going to save for my last one because it is probably my favorite poem, but I'm just going to, I'm going to lead with it because it's the only thing that I have that really ties in with this theme, even incidentally. This is by Percy Shelley. And it's a very famous poem. You can hear Brian Cranston read it in one of the uh, trailers for the final episodes of Breaking Bad. The and best it's episode it's the, the best episode of Breaking Bad, in fact, and it's the coolest trailer. But I'll read it for us now. Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. Nothing else remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. That's a pretty good poem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little interesting history about that poem is, uh, which I believe Jake illuminated to me one time. Um, as Jake likes to tell me interesting things, which is that um, wasn't Shelley in competition with another poet? And they both wrote poems, which were both published in such and such a publication at the time about this subject about yeah they had just discovered a uh this statue it's a real thing know. that they had found and they had there was like a egyptology was big something. at the time ozymandias by the way is ramses the second the great egyptian king the one that legend tells us kept would not let moses's people go legend tells us that <laughs> is that right well legend tells us that it, we don't know from the scriptures that it was ramsey the second we know from the scriptures what happened i don't think we do right i don't think it actually it's gives his right. name yeah i don't know but the the story goes that ramsey's the second was in fact the historical <laughs> guy from the bible that uh would not let god's people go in the story of moses so this is that guy is ozymandias and uh this is another take on the the transients of life a great civilization that now lies in dust and i don't know what else to say about it besides that well, it's, it's, a, it's one of the great little turns 
the level sand and the stretch. Well, just the, I mean, the, the idea, the metaphor, the whole, it's the, you know, it's the twist is yeah. he meant one thing and we read it as another thing. Yeah, it's the power of imagery. Mm-hmm. So the image helps you, it helps teach you about the fall of this great empire and what it means and how foolish our attempts at power and permanence can be because it's just going to fall apart and the sands are going to stretch far away. Yeah, I mean, it's just the perfect metaphor. And like I said, what's fascinating about it is that Shelley and this other guy apparently both had the metaphor, both had the idea, both were going to work with it. Maybe neither one of them came up with it, but just like some guy preached a big, long thing, and then Abraham Lincoln read the Gettysburg Address. Some guy wrote some poem about the same theme, and Shelley wrote this one, and guess what? We remember this one. (laughs) He got permanence. He got permanence, yep. Except for he didn't, because one day his poem will be lying in the dust of civilization. And Yeah, you can't tweet a poem. Nope. <laughs> oh, can't you? Well, I guess you could, sure. <laughs> you can tweet a, uh, what is a Japanese An image. thing? That... You can probably... A, a, a haiku. Yeah, yeah I've, I've definitely tweeted haikus before. Carlos Williams Willem? Yeah, that's probably under, under 120 characters. 40. <laughs> Tweet it right now. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Brandon, who was the book uh, written and produced by? You, Nathan Alverson. That's right. And don't you forget it. Uh, who performed it? Uh, you, Nathan Alverson, and Jake Minsel, and Brandon Chastain. That's right. And um, also, don't forget that, I guess, because <laughs> it means you probably have brain damage or something if you it do. It was executive produced by you, Nathan Alverson, and Jake Minsel. That's that's true. Now, who didn't executive produce it? Me, <laughs> Brandon Chastain. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, wait, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs>